yeah, uh, send me the uh, the um, invite to the DM when you start planning your your cult. I mean your your town. <laughs> <laughs> will do, sir. Will do. All right, Bro- brother Brevin will be welcome. <laughs> <laughs> No, no, we all have to take on new Christian names. Um, oh. I'll, be brother, I'll be uh Brother Athanasius, my patient. I like it. Ooh, can you run the Jude? I do uh, once you hey, all you have to do is get confirmed and you can get your own patron saint. Sweet. All all it takes is confirmation. Man, why didn't tell anyone tell me that sooner? Roses are red. Sex. It's an open. Time to repent. And submit to the Pope. Or Which- or to the patriarch of Constantinople. I don't really care. Just do something. <laughs> um I, I told that, uh, that. Hello, everyone, and welcome to yet another episode of The Problem with Reading. Uh, I'm Brevin. I'm Steven. And Sam is out this week because uh, he had things to do. I don't, I, I'm not sure what he's talking about. I don't know if they exist. Um, but he rest tells peace, us Sam. We'll remember you. Yeah, rest in peace. Uh, man. He he will be missed. Um, what a presence! What a voice! Uh, a, a sultry, sexy voice is what I'm told. Um, yes, but anyway, uh, given that uh, the transitions are working ever so well, uh, Stephen, what are you drinking right now? I am drinking a uh, a cup of coffee that I think I brewed yesterday and warmed up in the microwave. Uh, it's the high quality brand of Folgers with a little bit of whipped cream in it. Jesus, I know, right? That is. Let me tell you, the bachelor life. That is wow. Like I, <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay. Um, Please well, tell me I, you're sipping like a fine glass of scotch or something like that. That just like blows my mouth of water. I'm actually not going to talk about what I'm drinking now, but what I drank earlier this afternoon, which was some lovely kosher blackberry wine. Uh, I Ooh. found it at the store when I was wandering around talking to someone on the phone and, you know, I, I couldn't go to the register yet. So I was just browsing the, the things and I, and I, and I found this bottle of blackberry wine and I was like, what this exists. How does this exist? And why is it only $8? And so I got it and uh, we tried it and I, I, I feel like a, a squirrel um, with a magical sword in Redwall uh, at the midsummer uh, Eve feast. And it was great. It's it's going to be very dangerous in the future. I I just know, and I'm very satisfied. And there's there's like other wines there, like there's Concord Grape, which I can only assume uh, kind of it just tastes like normal wine. Maybe I don't know, but anyway, I'm very excited for this um, um, experiment to go further. And uh, the bottle's rather large, so yes. But but what are you drinking now, though? Oh, right now I'm having some uh, some uh, um, Evan Williams on the rocks. Yes, yeah, so yeah, and so in both cases, in both cases, way more classier than me. Infinite class. Infinite, Infinite class. class. Yes. Mm, yes, indeed. Mm. So, mm-hmm. The the Red Wall reference. So I've never read the Red Wall books. Uh, did they drink many... Did they drink much blackberry wine? Was that a thing? No. So, so one of the best things about Red Wall as a kid is in every single book, there will be probably, I would say, two to three, uh, like, ten-page chapters, scenes, where... It would just basically be describing a massive feast, and it would just describe in excruciating detail just all these ridiculous, amazing cheeses and cakes and pastries and roast vegetable, and just like it would just go on and on and on, and like every character has like their special dish that they make, and it would just happen over and over again in like every book, and they'd be drinking all sorts of different cordials and wines and juices, and it and and it would just go on and on, and it happened in every single book. And it's amazing, and it's it's very cool. Yes, I I uh, yeah yeah. I we actually should do a dramatic reading of a red wall uh, a feast scene. I, I, I think that, that would be good. You know what? I I might try and look this up. Put that sure, down on the here. on the notes of things to do. Put that down along on with, the notes. Along with silence, and uh, can the Orthodox Church and the Catholic Church ever get back together? Can mom and dad <laughs> ever remarry? <laughs> And also the Marvel Cinematic Universe. So we have a full slate here going going forward. Stay in tune, ladies and gentlemen. We got plenty of goodness. But but one of the great things about Redwall, though, and these feasts is that it was just so traditional. It would just happen over and over again. And tradition is one of the things that McIntyre talks about in today's reading, Chapter 15. So I'm going to do my best uh, to go through this uh, quickly and succinctly. 
Um, then we can discuss it, do our articles and get out of here because I've got some feedback that this is the most boring part. So if you're here, uh, good. Thank you. If not, uh, skip a little bit less than you normally do because I'll try. we're going to try and make it short. Um, so in chapter 15, uh, McIntyre notes that uh, all of the modern attempts uh, to talk about human life always uh, segment it into all these little parts where there's different norms and different modes of behavior. Uh, he mentions work from leisure, private from public, corporate from personal, individual from social, etc. And all of the actions within these spheres are uh, conceived of as distinct rather than part of the larger whole. And this, he says, corresponds also to the modern view of moral judgment. Both our selfhood and our moral judgments are segmented out in all these different fields in which there's no way to compare them, which is why there are no answers to anything, because everything is sort of unnecessarily split out. And his alternative to this modern view of sort of rationalizing and uh, segmenting everything is what he calls the narrative mode of selfhood, which he sees as the natural mode of of viewing um, the self. So to that end, he spends most of the chapter talking about why it's impossible to give an intelligible account of human actions outside of that narrative form of speaking. Uh, first quote, we cannot characterize behavior independently of intentions, end quote. And that's a relatively simple phrase, but it's important, and he spends several pages on it that I won't uh, go to in detail. But the short version of it is, we don't care about action as such. We don't care that you picked up your sister from school in your car, for example. That's an action, but it's only intelligible, and we only care about the intelligibility inside a large field of factors. That's the setting for that action that includes short-term goals and long-term goals and things that are ordered um, causally and temporally and that make reference to all of the different relationships that you're in with things and people, which put all together comprise the tradition and setting that you're in. So that's what makes a human action intelligible, and that's what we care about when we talk about human action. And this setting and these actions within the setting are necessarily fall into a narrative history. And these narrative histories turn into stories. That's the only way that we can think about our actions. That's the only way we do think about our actions. And thus, the content and framework is of paramount importance uh, in our actions, not the actions themselves, like some philosophers argue. And he argues that this narrative form is intrinsic and not just imposed. So people like Sartre would say that re- that uh, retroactively we impose a narrative order on the random actions that we make. McIntyre has some, some snarky lines on this, but the uh, best short line is just that stories are lived before they are told. And expanding on that, every person's individual drama, actions, and setting interacts and exerts pressure on every single other person as well. So from there, you can get into a larger uh, system of traditions. These narratives that we tell ourselves and that we are uh, have a teleological nature in that they're guided by some vision of the future, some variety of ends and goals. The unpredictable and teleological natures of narratives coexist so that we never know exactly what will happen next, but we still have things that shape and guide us towards that end. Uh, Thus it emerges that, quote, man is in his actions and practice as well as in his fictions essentially a storytelling animal, end quote. And so we're each the subject of our own personal history. And so, for example, when a suicidal person says that their life is meaningless, he or she is, quote, complaining that the narrative of their life has become unintelligible to them, that it lacks any point, any movement towards a climax or telos, end quote. And so he talks about the importance of the unity of an individual life is the unity of a narrative embodied in that life. And it's the notion of a quest towards particular goals in which obstructions are encountered and dealt with, and so dealing the goals of the quest come to be fully understood. And the virtues are those things that help us achieve the goods internal to practices and to engage in that long-term quest. And this is where he gets into the tradition bit, because he argues that the good is tied to particular circumstances and is particular to social roles, which, quote, constitute the given of my life and are, quote, in part what gives my life its own moral particularity, end quote. So any social identity is is tied to particular historical identity, and these particularities impose initial moral limitations, quote, but it is in moving forward from such particularity that the search for good for the universal consists, end quote. However, the total escape of the particular into the universal is an illusion and a fiction with painful consequences, and that's one of the problems he sees with modernity, and that what each person is, is in large part what they inherit, and each individual is the bearer of a tradition. Uh, What he does 
as he concludes this chapter before he goes into the next three to explain sort of the way forward, is he takes a shot at Edmund Burke and and contemporary conservatives who, quote, contrast tradition with reason and the stability of tradition with conflict, end quote. But he sees this as just an extension of modern individualism that's preserving an older version of liberal individualism instead of a more modern one. And that any tradition once becomes Burkean in the sense that there's an active uh, attempt to conserve it in the way that Burke describes, that that tradition is dead and that it's, it's, it's no longer a living tradition, which is what he's concerned with. Um, uh, finally, he says that, quote, it is the lack of any such unifying conception of a human life which underlies the modern denials of the factual character of moral judgments, end quote. So in, in other words, um, to, to conclude, uh, it's not only that we can't have conversations about morality anymore, um, uh, we also uh, don't know what life is. So it just gets better and better here in uh, here after virtue. I can tire cheery as always. Although I guess that when you think about it, that does somewhat follow if one cannot have a, a an actual conversation around ethics, around seeking out the good, one like th- kind of what remains is at the very least kind of a hollowed out husk of life, um, maybe uh, a simulacra of life, but not actual human life as it should be um kind of the human life is searching out its talos once you lose that ability it's kind of over we've we've talked about the 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 trolley problem as sort of you know being the classic contrasting deontology versus consequentialism question and like testing moral theses like is this the right action or, or the wrong action but it is very interesting and convicting i think how mcintyre sidesteps over the course of many chapters and, you know, a complicated and nuanced argument, that that is essentially missing the point, that that's missing the entire question of a unified human life, of a good narrative, of a good tradition to be in, of a good way to live, and how, I, I don't know, like the conversations that we have and we're, we're tricked back into the trolley problem meme over and over again in all sorts of different ways in our life where we're segmented out, where we miss the the larger question. That's well said. I I think that was what kind of initially charmed me about utilitarianism was it gave answers to those kind of logic puzzles, which ironically enough, the trolley problem was originally created as a critique against utilitarianism. But still the utilitarian or even deontological approach to ethics, it gives very concrete answers. Whereas virtue ethics is kind of okay with saying, yeah, we're not going to have every answer to every scenario we are, as McIntyre kind of said, uh, laid out in this chapter, we are instead living in a living tradition, uh, that is, uh, a tradition that is kind of constantly in dialogue with itself on what does the good life look like. Um, so it almost becomes that ethics becomes a lot more closely tied to the overall branch of philosophy um, mm-hmm. or the overall trunk of philosophy, I guess, uh, which is probably what you know, it, it never should have left the trunk in the first place. Actually, to, to tie this into several disparate but now interconnecting threads, my wife and I are watching The Good Place, and one of the big themes of season three, spoiler alert, insert siren noise here, is that it's impossible to get to The Good Place based on the point system because the world is infinitely complicated, and that, you know, like buying a tomato supports child labor essentially, which is, you know, just dooms you right from the start. Humans make so many actions because of the, the complexity of the world. Um, you know, it, it, the, the good place is point system. It's like a karma thing. Like, you know, you do good actions, you get good points, you do bad things, you get bad points. That's not important. But the point is, is that the segmenting out of actions as discrete questions, actions as such, as opposed to the unity of a human life, is what's happening in the good place and is the source of, in, in, that's what's happening in the show, and it's the source of the of the conflict of the show where things aren't working. Um, ah, damn it! I lost the other train of thought, Stephen. You said something good, and you and you, and you triggered it, but then I got caught up in the vagaries of an NBC drama. Curses! Actually, to be fair, I so I've seen the first season of uh, The Good Place, and I would say it's probably one of the. It is a show that I think I would say is in at least the top three, if not the top show that I've ever seen that kind of handles philosophical questions reasonably well like obviously they're not getting up on a lectern and giving a nuanced critique of Kant or whatever but they actually get a lot of points right which I guess I'm refreshed at seeing an NBC show actually have an 
a quasi intelligent conversation around ethics. So, I mean, how how many shows you know get fab ratings and talk about the categorical imperative? I mean, you can count them on one finger, literally. I mean, it it is an intriguing thing. So, like, philosophy itself is kind of the desire to kind of figure out what the good life is for humans and how to kind of enable that. And then ethics, it just takes that. And, and I would say ethics is one of the more applied fields of philosophy. But the fact that we kind of let it get abstracted to the point where we're only talking about is this particular action right or wrong, but we're missing the entire context, the entire narrative of that action. It does show kind of it, it, it contributes to the overall points that McIntyre is making, how far away from the original project of the uh, of ethics itself we have gone. Yeah. I mean, what I well, I, I, I mean, are arguably and this is. Actually, see, like, this is why we started the podcast, even though this isn't going to show up on there. Okay, so what do you think about the idea that ethics conceptually can't or should not be done because uh, of basically the argument that he just made? So human lives have to be viewed as a unity, which happens within a particular tradition. Essentially, ethics attempts to universalize what needs to be particular. Ooh, well said. Um, I would say that ethics... Okay, so formal ethics can provide us with certain heuristics. Um, like there has to be like, uh, I don't know. I, I, one of the hard things about McIntyre, sorry, I, I'm interrupting you. Go ahead. You're totally fine. Um, well, okay, okay. So yeah, I don't know if there are any traditions that, that exist, but hypothetically, um, okay. So let's say, let's just consider Catholicism writ large um, mm-hmm. as a tradition that kind of exists. Like we all, like we have the same catechism at, at the very least. So, there Wait, can be, would there be anyone who would object to the Catholic tradition existing? No, sorry, so it's like, a very obvious thing. I'm talking about Catholics as a population. We accept the catechism, kind of. I mean, some of us do. So hypothetically, that is a tradition that exists within the, the wider world. So, so I would argue that ethics could only properly be done within the tradition of Catholicism for Catholics, under McIntyre's argument. You couldn't abstract that out any further. I think you could abstract it out to particular communities, uh, re Powerwas, uh, which I think Powerwas is building off of McIntyre, to be fair, or the other way around. I think it's Powerwas on Mac. So, for example, a small community of, I don't know, a small farm community, um, see Wendellberry. Let's go with Wendellberry. Wendellberry's community is not particularly religious. I think they have a church, but that is at least in Jaber Crow that is very underemphasized. Um, mm-hmm. They do not acquire their ethics or their virtue through the church. They acquire it through each other, through their their lived lives with each other, uh, the kind of shared narrative. Mm-hmm. And I would say that that would be a perfect example of virtue in community in in a sorry in a particular tradition, not religious, uh, but the tradition of that particular community. That's fine. Sorry, what what I'm going after is ethics. Uh, qua field of universal moral questions is illegitimate. That's well. I, that's I think I'm you're. Arguing. I think you're right on that. I mean, if so, I'm I'm reading through Brothers K right now, and his very kind of essential point, is, or one of the points he makes, one of the fifty million points he makes, is you know, if God is dead, everything is permissible, or what have you. Which I think a lot of atheists would kind of balk at and say no. But there is kind of an interesting. There's an interesting disconnect that comes between a lot of people who just accept very different premises. Um, to the Christian or to the atheist, you, we are working from very, very different views of the universe. And therefore, to an extent, it becomes impossible for us to have serious dialogues up to a point. Like, yep. we can both agree that this is wrong, but the method we're going about discussing right and wrong, even that is very different because we're coming from two very different traditions. Um, so then contra McIntyre, due to the fact of the world and that we're not in, you know, uh, Sindo anarchist utopia where we can't form our own independent associations of you know binding rules uh, which you are v- voluntarily join as much as that is possible um, and then you know can be legitimately enforced to do to the, volu- uh, the the voluntary nature of the association I I don't want to pull a Sam here but I feel like we end up right back at liberalism frankly liberalism or libertarianism liberalism okay, like, I thought like he was liber- liber- libertarianism I, I, I well, libertarianism is classical liberalism, kind of. Oh, okay, I see, I see. Uh, like, like we end up back in in the point where traditions do not exist in traditions are. Uh, blah, blah, blah. 
states have encompassed multiple traditions all over the place. And so we don't have the option of, we have to interact with people who are not of our tradition in ways that barring a system to do that, you know, would result in conflict. That actually brings me uh, to the rant I'm going to have, but uh, I'll say that too for another time. Um, I would say McIntyre. So, spoiler alert, everyone to uh, to those of you uh, to those of you who don't know, McIntyre at the end will propose, in essence, a second Saint Benedict is what we need. Uh, somebody who will establish small communities that can kind of carry on these sort of ethical dialogues and these ethical traditions, uh, while kind of the rest of the world starts you know, burning because they can't figure out how to do ethics. So I think to an extent, he would just nod his head and say, yeah, um, about the most, a large government, especially one that is kind of of necessity, so pluralistic. I'm not even critiquing the government at this point. It's like you have tons of various traditions, all of which are at least semi-competing. And you've just got to kind of, you just kind of have to play lowest common denominator try to keep everyone from killing each other and that's about the most ethical conversations you can or the the most in-depth conversation you can have uh with ethics at least at a high governmental level so mcintyre would say well yeah so if we want to preserve this we are in in we are in a society right now that cannot do that and so we need to form our own societies that can do that and again this was before he was catholic so yep. he wasn't like trying to forward this Catholic manifesto. He was just saying like, look, this is, this is the situation we're in. We're host. We need someone to figure this out. Damn. So what I'm hearing is that, uh, uh, one, were you hearing uh, anything? I was, yes. Oh. Uh, was Sam, Sam was right. Um, uh, and also I was right. So we need to build monasteries and also something, something federalism. Ah. Uh, I'm, I'm just mad and frustrated that our society sucks. Um, all right. Uh, with that, I, I, I think, um, uh, to be fair, there was a whole bunch deleted that you did not hear, dear listener, uh, singular. Um, oh. But we're going to plow forward to our two articles and bring this uh, episode to a close. Um, uh, the articles are a bit practical today. There's no sp- specific reason why, but they're very real world. Um, not theoretical at all. I'm not sure what to make of that. Uh, but, uh, Stephen, First I believe... Us. You have an article for us. I, I do indeed. And so my article is, uh, quote, and the least feminist nation in the world is Denmark by Richard Orange and Pamela Duncan. Uh, so Denmark is a prime example of gender equality in quite a few areas. Uh, the pay gap is very small. Uh, there are equal employment rights, universal nursery care, nursery care, and so on. Uh, it is on some accounts the model of what feminists want. And in my opinion, rightly so. These things are good and proper. Ironically enough, though, uh, an article in The Guardian, this particular article, uh, recently explored how Denmark is one of the least feminist nations in the developed world, where only one in six Danes consider themselves a feminist. Uh, One in four females uh, or one in four female Danes consider themselves feminist. Uh, One in three Danes say that wolf whistling is acceptable. And two out of five Danes take issue with the hashtag MeToo movement. Uh, The neighboring European countries, uh, while trailing behind in things such as pay gap, have significantly higher ratios of men and women who consider themselves feminist. Uh, Notabene, this shouldn't be exaggerated too much. Uh, Sweden, for example, has 46% females who consider themselves feminist. So it's not like it's a complete swing where, you know, some other country has like 90% of people who consider feminist. But that's that's neither here nor there. Uh, One of the intriguing things I found in the article was the concept of low-level sexual harassment as excusable if it meant well. Quote, I don't mind wolf whistling so long as it's done in a nice way, uh, end quote. One, inter- one woman interview says, uh, quote, I see it as a compliment, actually, end quote. Uh, Dr. Dr. Adriessen, I'm not sure how to pronounce that, uh, but who is professor of communication studies at Roskilde University, identifies this as seeing actions as intentions rather as actions in themselves. Quote, we have had a culture where what you say isn't racist or sexist if you don't intend it to me. You can grab a woman, but so long as you did it because it was, quote, fun, then culturally we tend to think it's not that bad, end quote. She, of course, sees this as an issue, and I mean, so do I, it, and that is quite misogynistic, uh, and I think she's, you know, correct in that. But I'm intrigued with this article, not necessarily out of any 
uh, anti-feminist platform. I consider myself a cautious feminist, which is to say I like a, the I like a lot of the feminist narrative. Um, and so I'm always intrigued by why people remain skeptical of feminism, uh, a country that has conquered or at least has come close to conquering a large set of the problems women face, but still remains skeptical of feminism proper is certainly an enigma. Uh, unfortunately, the article doesn't it really draw any conclusions. It's pretty short. Uh, some Danes interviewed expressed a willingness to consider intent into what are otherwise clearly sexist actions. Some expressed a dislike to, of this willingness. I certainly hope that there will be some further exploration into this issue uh, because it is a very interesting test case. Uh, a country that is ostensibly very feminist in its platform, but still has somewhat antagonistic uh, views towards feminism proper. So I, I, it's a very intriguing article. Uh, I just, it, it's very descriptive, not prescriptive. Uh, so I'm, I'm intrigued and I hope that further research will go into this. So I'm, <clears throat> I'm going to disagree with you, Stephen, slightly in that you say that a country with hypothetically the most, uh, quote unquote, feminist outcomes has the least percentage of quote unquote, people who identify as feminist. Mm -hmm. Um, and arguably that actually makes perfect sense. I mean, if your goals are accomplished, what's the point of campaigning i mean the the um feminism label in at least part is a progressive in the sense of there is progress to make uh mm. label so if that's accomplished in many parts obviously not all but in denmark you know they have high scores in a number of these key areas i mean universal nursery care pay gap etc you know what's the point of making more progress when you've arrived where everyone else aspires to be and so you kind of might loop this around uh, in 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 what I love to in, in what actually Thomas coined as the uh, the horseshoe theory of wokeness, where you get so woke you end up being trad. Um, you you, <laughs> you could see this with the, with uh, some recent posts about like uh, well never mind. Um, but anyway, um, where 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 you get so equal structurally, let's say that you could loop back around to even more primal male female relations um so like for example the there's survey data to indicate that the societies that are the most free in terms of uh inhibitions to uh women ch to female choice so let's say social economic social factors that direct uh individuals towards certain ends based on their gender um in the societies where those are virtually eliminated, there is still there there exists and there exists a larger percent of uh, females and males that go to that go towards traditionally female or male activities by self selection with no structural constraint. So almost as if once you get to the point where there is absolute freedom, you kind of end back up where you started, but by but by free choice in um, in away like once you get to the point that you're aiming for uh denmark essentially you know sort of vaguely judging by the article they stopped shifting the goalposts. like they've reached the place to be managed they've reached the end of history they've reached progress and then from there you know people just divide and do as they will um yeah i don't know i think you do bring up a very solid point in that kind of if there's no progress to be made, if you've already kind of arrived there, then yeah, you can kind of drop whatever platform got you there and, you know, two thumbs up, we're all good. Uh, I, I would still say, though, that, for example, the the wolf whistling thing, that one surprises me um, that that's oh, no, sure. that viewed as an okay thing. And that strikes me as something that like feminism proper, well, I think feminism just in general, uh, would probably say, ah, leave some room for improvement you know um well no 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 i'm i'm so here's here's actually an interesting question that i don't have an answer for um hmm. and to tie into mcintyre there's the question of particularity um hmm. so in new york for example i would say people of enlightened um uh equalist sensibility would say that's bad in new york hmm. that that is a un, that's a bad thing you're being a, a, a generally unpleasant person if if you engage in such behavior. However, Denmark is a particular place with a very particular uh, social makeup and, you know, high levels of social trust, high level of social solidarity. In, in short, it's not comparable in any demographic or I don't even know what the right term would be. It's not comparable, for example, to the US. It, it's an entirely different culture. It's, it, it's functionally alien. And in that context, 
the appeal that the professor makes for a example is universalist. And that's not to make a judgment and say, catcalling is okay if you're in Denmark. That's not what I'm saying. But, but what I'm saying is, is that there is a, a sub-question that's yet to be had about how far particularist situations can change our perception of what otherwise would be universally condemned things. Because the U.S. is unique in its multiplicity of traditions and, and, and cultures, for example. Denmark is, very the, solid point. Is, the, is the polar opposite of that. And that's not to make a judgment. It's just to say, I don't know what the answer to this is. Um, and to be hasty about it, I think, would be to ignore some suggestions that we should not be hasty. It's certainly, we'll we'll take a, a page out of Shrewbeard's book. I and I think that's where kind of ultimately I reading it. I kept I kind of kept wanting to come to conclusions, but there just certainly there there just wasn't enough evidence. There wasn't enough discussions. There were a few surveys made and a few anecdotal uh, points, kind of pro and contra. But on the whole, I think just more more research needs to go into this before any definitive things are said. Yeah. Yeah. Slash uh, comparative studies are easy to mismanage, which leads me right into my own article entitled Don't Blame Washington for Venezuela's Oil Woes, a Rebuttal. Uh, this is, was in America's Quarterly. Basically, it's a rebuttal to an article that compared Venezuela to Colombia and argued that um, the U.S. sanctions on Venezuela caused the economic collapse that happened in 2017 and beyond. So this is a little bit wonky slash uh, nerdy, but the short version, the too long didn't read, is that despite what some people say, Venezuela's economic and social wo- and uh, social woes, which include you know eating dogs, blackout, civil war, Russian and Cuban mercenaries everywhere, uh, which uh, oil production is a sort of proxy number for, are due primarily to internal mismanagement. Uh, to put that lightly, and are not the fault of U.S. sanctions or external forces. Um, The slightly longer version is that some economists, uh, namely Jeffrey Sachs, argue that the U.S. caused this collapse, um, and their evidence for this is the counterfactual of Colombia, which is doing just fine, um, at least uh, relative to, you know, the social apocalypse in Venezuela. But a little bit of history on Jeffrey Sachs. Uh, He's an economist, uh, history with the U.N., also a history of uh, destroying the Russian economy uh, post-USSR, um, blowing up, metaphorically, um, villages in Africa, um, and generally promoting kind of garbage theories of uh, economic development. And, and he's back again, folks, with yet another bad theory. Anyway, th- there's a million reasons why their argument is dumb. First, uh, as very succinctly shown in uh, the article that I'm talking about, uh, if you expand the timeline of Venezuela versus um, Colombia, then their graph, you very clearly see that there is absolutely no comparison between these two nations. The data just makes zero sense at all. Uh, second, there's a laundry list of political differences between Maduro's genius regime and the Colombian government, which despite its you know various setbacks is um, at least not a dictatorship. Third, and this was a huge oversight. The uh, the oil that the two nations produce is actually entirely different. While Venezuela has like an entirely diversified portfolio among uh, light, heavy, and crude, or wait, light, crude, and something. I forget what the types are. Anyway, they have all three kinds, but Colombia has only heavy oil, which is the uh, least profitable kind. And so the prices are entirely different. And while Venezuela should be resilient, Colombia is entirely not. And so while Colombia has been up and down over the years, Venezuela has just been consistently down since Maduro took office in the early 2000s. And in addition to that, the article also gets into very bad places with its mortality rates, which it just says, oh, the U.S. imposed sanctions, and everyone started dying. It's like, well, I mean, no. And also, look at the overall trend. This makes zero sense when you look at any of the data, but they have, you know, Sachs has no counterfactuals. And basically, the... Yet another short version of it is that Sachs is arguing against U.S. US intervention in Venezuela. He's not a fan of that, which is fine. I agree. Don't invade Venezuela. Let's not do that. But his his, uh, data and his arguments uh, for that are are quite abysmal, um, is is the uh, technical term. I I liked this article particularly because it's kind of another example of the the whole lies, damn lies, and statistics, or figures lie and liars figure, uh, because you have... Two very different narratives based on the same numbers, but one is kind of condensing the numbers and one is expanding the numbers and saying like, well, no, you, 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 you took 
a small sample set and you didn't consider the overall, like how this fits into the overall narrative. And it seems certainly that the, uh, the kind of counter article is a very good counter uh, to the original narrative that was kind of being given as U.S. imposed sanctions, therefore everyone's dying. Uh, so I, I did find it a very kind of yet again, man, statistics in using figures to kind of forward your arguments is sometimes a little questionable unless you're actually, you know, doing it in good faith. Yep. And also, I will never pass up an opportunity to uh, rip on Jeffrey Sachs, who, um, from me over in the neo-institutionalist camp, uh, <laughs> we uh, we do love to dunk on him every chance we have. Um, but speaking of dunking, uh, Stephen, I believe you have a, a rant for us? I do indeed, and it's a rant, uh, strangely enough, very related to our current uh, chapter of McIntyre. Uh, and my rant is on... A, a certain company that will remain nameless, uh, that is the one I work, on, I work at, and uh, it, we were recently uh, talking, and there was some big uh, kind of uh, hullabaloo that happened, and the, uh, the CEO and various leadership staff were, were talking, and at one point, they say the, it was supposed to be inspirational, and I can sort of see where they're coming from, but they said like, you know, nation divides don't matter. You know, different religions don't matter. We can all come together as one company and unite and work. And I just, I remember thinking like, yes, certainly I can work with coworkers that have different views of, of you know, religion than I do, or, you know, certainly different, you know, like different nationalities or what have you. I'm happy to work with them. That's awesome. But just the underlying philosophy that that is like, I, I, I am at this company because you are paying me. Literally, the moment you stop paying me, I will never show up. And I'm supposed to consider the banner of a company that I'm only there to because to, to earn a paycheck. I'm supposed to consider that over my country and my God. What kind of asinine statement is that? that, that that's just absolutely absurd. And it's a very strange thing because companies are more and more being viewed as these bastions of morality and decency. And I just kind of scratch my head and I'm just like, people, this is, this is not where you should be place, placing your faith in. If you don't want religion, fair enough, but you're seriously looking to companies that are only there to make money and you are only there to make money. That's, that's where you're putting your hope. That's where you're hoping to find your, your ethical tradition, your philosophical meta narrative. It just the, the absurdity of that situation is. It, it, it was just priceless, and I made sure to keep my mouth very shut uh, about that. But now I can open my, open my mouth about how absurd that asinine statement is. Um, but speaking of uh, great, or rather not feeling great, <laughs> transition, uh, minor irritation. I, I took my first uh, sick day ever um, this last week. Um, I went into work, um, and then a uh, kindly coworker uh, bullied me into going home. Um, with a sort of a flu, you know, throat, uh, congestion, cough, runny nose, headache, the whole shebang. And I appreciate that a lot. But I, I realized sort of post, you know, taking a day and a half to recover, that I, I came to work with a kind of college mentality in which you just kind of go for it, you push through, you know, you just, you you show up and you do the work even if you, you know, suffer for it. And I, I did not realize that, that sick days really do have a purpose. Um, you are given them when you are sick to stay home and to not infect all of your colleagues and inhibit the productivity of them thereof, but also to give yourself a, a respite with which to recover and return to the workforce, uh, hale and hearty to uh, serve our uh, corporate overlords. And they are, you know, useful and important. Um, but no one really ever told me that. Uh, so I didn't know until this said coworker bullied me to go home. And it reminds me just sort of vaguely of the same coworker talking about like his home ec classes where he would actually be sent to the store with a given amount of money to buy the ingredients for the food that he proposed and then would learn how to cook it. And like actual practical real world knowledge that he learned in the middle of Ohio, like the home ec was real y'all. I'm just saying. And uh, he had a good education for life based on that. Uh, and I did not, but I think it would be better if, we all did. Uh, so there. Well said. Well said. I I do sympathize with you on the sick days, and it, you do get a weird thing because a lot of people view kind of taking sick days as waving a white flag or surrendering or like not being as dedicated or as loyal, and that's why 
in general, whenever I have, whenever I hear a coworker saying like, oh, I'm not feeling well, I'm just going to work from home or whatever. I kind of, I at least try to somewhat say like, look, you have sick days for a reason. If you have sick days left, use them. Like you're, so, you're not feeling well. So let yourself just have a day off. And it, it, it does become a strange thing where it's viewed almost as a loyalty thing. So I'm glad your coworker is kind of, is realizing that those sick days are there for a reason now that you, and now that you are one of, one of the few that, that realize that sick days are a glorious thing. Yeah. Yep. Worked out uh, quite, quite well here for me in uh, the old Boston of MA of USA. Mm -hmm. Uh, So with that, I, I do believe, um, Stephen, I'm, I'm I'm not a hundred percent, but I, I don't think there are any more things in the universe, in the universe that we could talk about. And not at all. Like we've exhausted everything. Like 100 out of 100%. Um, then according to McIntyre, we're dead because a tradition that isn't living and isn't in constant dialogue is is no longer alive. So that's actually bad news for us, man. That's really bad news. Damn. Um, Hopefully Sam will come back and help us out. Perhaps he can revive us with his weird, I don't know, neoliberal order stuff. I don't know. What does he do? What does he contribute? Everything, <laughs> so I'm told. Anyway. Yeah, pretty much. He's the only reason people listen. And I'm okay yeah. with that. Yeah, yeah, I'm 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 fine being window dressing to Sam's slow rise to global domination. <laughs> Maybe he'll remember us when he comes into his kingdom. Remember us when you come into your power, Sam. Mm-hmm. Um, all right. Uh, so for everyone, by which I mean me and Stephen here at the Problem with Reading, uh, I am the aforementioned Brevin. The aforementioned Stephen. And we will see you next time. Adios. Ba da pa pa pa. Tradition. And I think we may have record time. That we are officially less than a, than an hour. That is, oh my goodness! Especially after we cut everything. Oh man, we're yep. gonna we're gonna be down to so maybe even a glorious fifty minutes. This is gonna be like thirty seven minutes, and we're just gonna be like, oh my god, what is this madness? But honestly, that was that was some good conversation though. I.